Chapter Seven of the Adventures of a Nature Guide by Enos Mills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Naturalist meets prospector. No treetop adventures were in my plans when one autumn afternoon I started out for a three weeks trip on the summit slopes of the Rocky Mountains. Nor was I planning to have discussions with prospectors their ways were not mine nor my ways theirs which fact as will be seen caused me trouble i thought to be in the wilds alone i carried no firearms just a raincoat a few pounds of raisins and a hatchet along the way i intended to visit beaver colonies trees at timberline alpine lakes and glacier meadows and hoped to extend my acquaintance with that strange tree the lodgepole pine i had made many similar trips and was ready as usual to delay and watch wild animals by the hour or to turn aside and investigate any subject of interest whether new or old for a while all went smoothly a few miles from my cabin i came to a number of beaver colonies on the slope of long's peak they were strung bead-like in the shallow channel of a stream along the top of a gigantic moraine that thrust forward like a great delta from a canyon. At that time, it was commonly believed that winter weather could be foretold from the autumn preparations of beavers. If they raised the height of their dam and deepened the pond, it meant cold weather and unusually thick ice if they laid in an extra-large food supply it meant that the winter would be long i had assumed this theory to be correct but on this trip i had to change my old belief in beaver weather wisdom at one place two colonies side by side had made unlike preparations in one extensive and almost complete preparations had been made for the winter in the other the beavers had just begun to cut down trees for the winter food supply and neither house nor dam had been repaired after i had seen many similar cases it was impressed upon me that the extent of the preparations which beavers made for winter was determined by the requirements of the colony chiefly by the number of beavers in it if dam or house was repaired it was because it needed repairs beginning these preparations early or beginning them late might be due to the greater or less amount of work to be done or to the individuality of the leader of a colony i lingered among crags in a moorland above the timberline and watched a flock of bighorn sheep a number were feeding others were playing and a few were lying down two sentinels each poised upon a commanding rock were eternally vigilant for possible danger they appeared not to suspect a nearby enemy on a rock cliff that cut into the sky a mountain lion crouched and occasionally raised his head for more than an hour he lay looking down on the sheep when the sheep started to feed away from these rocks the lion descended and disappeared the first treetop incident of my trip though interesting lacked the amusing yet annoying features of the later ones in what is now wild basin in the rocky mountain national park while examining peeled places in high limbs evidently the work of porcupines i chanced to look across a small nearby opening and saw a little black bear ambling along he walked up to a limber pine and climbed into it three limbs that outshot from the trunk about thirty feet above the earth afforded a resting place and he lay down upon his back and apparently at once went to sleep black bears may almost be considered perching animals for much of the time when not active they rest or sleep in a treetop each bear appears to have one or more trees in his territory that he regularly uses then began my adventures in the neighborhood of arapahoe peak 
I climbed into another treetop, hoping to discover the cause of the tree's dying condition. Climbing outward on a huge, steeply inclined limb, I hugged it closely, and from time to time stopped to look carefully into the crevices of the broken bark. A stockman was concealed behind a tree clump a short distance away, watching me. He was quite unable to understand why an unarmed person should be prowling through the woods miles from anywhere, and why anyone should climb into a tree and examine it so minutely was beyond his comprehension. His astonishment knew no bounds when I descended and rapidly removed earthy matter from the roots so as to examine them. From this treetop I had seen and decided to examine a tall spruce which appeared to be dying from a beetle attack, and I hoped to discover the species of insect that was doing the damage. Toward this tree I walked rapidly and hurriedly climbed up into it. The stockman's curiosity got the better of him. He made haste to follow me and reached the bottom of the tree about the time I had gained the limb entanglement in the top throwing up a club to attract my attention he demanded which one of the monkey families are you a member of anyway i descended to have a talk with him my explanation of nature study as the motive for the strange actions he had witnessed was accepted evidently with a proverbial grain of salt but as i appeared harmless he let the matter pass and told me something of himself Droughty conditions on the plains had led him to drive his small herd of cattle into the mountains, where there was luxuriant feed in a number of adjacent meadows. The stockman had a cabin nearby. As for a number of days I had been living on bark and berries, I gladly accepted his invitation and went over to supper. He was born in Texas, had been a cowboy in that state and elsewhere in the southwest and he entertained me mightily until midnight with stirring snatches of biography then i bade him good night went back to my old raincoat crawled into it built a fire and lay down to sleep we had parted the best of friends but in the night a wolf played me a shabby trick he raided the stockman's sparsely populated hen roost and carried off a chicken which he stopped to devour close to my camp. A few tell-tale feathers were left. The following day the stockman called my attention to them and warned me that it would not be well for me to take another chicken. I protested my innocence, but appearances were against me. Here you are, he said, without a piece of bacon or a scrap of food of any kind. You don't have a gun or any means of procuring food in the wilderness. You have no visible means of support. Not even your next meal is in sight. Men are often hanged on less satisfactory evidence. The next night, another chicken disappeared, and the following morning I was awakened early and rather violently confronted by a stockman and a Winchester, and told to leave the country speedily. I saw the futility of argument and quickly complied. Arriving an hour or so later on Buchanan Pass, about 11,000 feet above sea level, I looked back down the mountain. With the recent encounter fresh in mind, I did not wish to risk again being taken for a lunatic or a suspicious character. No one was in sight, so I stopped to examine a number of sprawling, storm-battered trees soon becoming absorbed in their interesting features. The place was dry and windswept. Most of the trees were limber pines. Along the continental divide the wind blows violently, sometimes for days. Many of the trees were so wind-worn that they appeared a million years old. Numbers were able to grow only a foot or so above the level of the earth. The wind's terrific sand blasts cut off every exposed leaf and twig. At one place, nearly an acre was covered with low, dense tree growth. Having a low shelter to the windward, 
the trees had grown up to the height of nearly two feet above this they were trimmed off almost as level as a lawn again and again through countless summers the twigs had grown up only to be mown off the following winter by flying sand this had resulted in a crowded matted spiny growth more dense and a great deal more rigid than a hedge top that has been annually trimmed for a generation i walked readily all over the top and only occasionally did my feet break through what a nice spring mattress it would have made jumping into a treetop or falling out of it here was but a commonplace performance several miles down the western slope of the mountain a number of pieces of rich gold float had recently been discovered but i was not long permitted to revel in such fancies while i was examining the little six-foot timberline forest three prospectors appeared they accosted me with a request for my business i told them of my interest in these storm-shaped trees they wanted to know what there was unusual about them i tried to explain the great age of these trees the forces that had dwarfed and distorted them they asked me for a piece of bacon i had none they desired to know where my roll of blankets was i told them i did not carry one they wanted to know what kind of gun i used to find that i was unarmed was too much for them one asked me where i came from he was promptly answered by one of the others who expressed the conviction that i was from an insane asylum this was another case where explanations would avail nothing quickly leaving these unsympathetic fellows i crossed the mountain descending the western slope i stopped occasionally to examine the trees and the tree clumps and to talk here and there to an individual old spruce without my knowing it the prospectors had followed me they thought i might have located a rich mine and my queer conduct in their eyes was simply a ruse to throw them off their guard when far down the slope i concluded to count the number of trees in about an acre of dense spruce growth after measuring the area i paced back and forth among the trees touching each in turn talking to one now and then and making many oral comments all the time without my suspecting it the three prospectors lay hidden nearby watching my every move hearing some things i said and doubtless commenting scornfully upon the show on this acre were two thousand seven hundred and forty one spruces i discovered a charred pitch pine stump in the spruce area it was closely surrounded by spruces about two hundred years of age the presence of this fire-colored fire-charred stump puzzled me for i did not then know that this region had been swept by a forest fire about two hundred years before and that the stump had received fire preservation treatment which enabled it to endure with but little change with my hatchet i split off a piece of wood and drawing my magnifying glass lay down to examine it this proceeding was too much for the prospectors they rushed upon me demanding to know if i had found gold and were disgusted to see me examining a piece of pitch pine their comments were so uncivil that i promptly left them and wandered away into the woods again without my knowledge they followed after traveling about a mile i came to a glacial meadow surrounded by an engelmann spruce growth in the margin between spruce and meadow i found a splendid grove of lodgepole pines and stopped to examine them they too were nearly two hundred years of age they stood close together and the crowding had prevented their being much more than towering poles about one hundred feet high the lodgepole pine lives one of the most interesting stories in all the forest world it is a pioneer tree one of the first and most successful to take possession of burned over areas 
it is most easily killed by fire yet every forest fire that sweeps its territory proves an advantage to it throughout the west in the last fifty years the numerous forest fires have enabled the lodgepole greatly to extend its holdings a complete cessation of forest fires would also exterminate it it may be said to cooperate with fires so closely is its life interrelated with them it begins to bear seeds at an early age often it hoards all its seeds keeping them in cones and the cones upon the tree year after year sometimes for twenty years or longer but if a fire sweeps its territory the wax is melted from the cones that survive they at once open and the seeds fall out to drop into ash-covered soil a place where they will thrive the best the fire had consumed insect enemies and removed the cause of shade most young trees will not grow without shade but young lodgepoles will not grow in it they thrive best in the full glare of the sun trees of other species that come among them and grow taller shade and exterminate them i was particularly drawn to one old fellow in this grove it was without limbs for the first fifty or sixty feet and tapered so little that its trunk at the first limbs appeared to have a thickness about equal to its diameter only a few feet above the roots this was a fraction more than twelve inches eager to know the diameter at the first limbs i climbed up seating myself comfortably on the lowest limb i was just in the act of measuring the trunk diameter when below i caught sight of the three approaching prospectors near my tree they stopped and stared up at me having no use for them in fact feeling myself above them i paid no attention but went on measuring presently one called what in the blankety blank are you doing up there come down and be quick about it down i slid plainly they were greatly put out though i had certainly done them no harm they seemed to consider my incomprehensible performance a personal affront and were likely to handle me roughly when still three to four feet above the earth i leaped from the tree and the three heavy-booted men all kicked at me at once they all missed me they made a number of kicks but being agile i managed each time to be just where their feet were not presently they ceased kicking and declared that i had been purposely misleading them all day my denial did not help matters but they finally cut short the interview by demanding that i vanish into the woods as this was just what i wanted to do i complied and on the way home unhampered by further misunderstandings of the scientific spirit i continued my acquaintance with that interesting pioneer tree the lodgepole pine End of chapter seven